Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, this is the session on pH and connective tissue diseases. And I think we're going to get started. We have a full agenda here since uh, connective tissue diseases covers a lot of area and pH in connective tissue diseases covers a lot of area. And I'm sure you all have a lot of questions to ask of us. I'm very privileged to be here today. I'm Dr. Virginia Steen. I'm a rheumatologist. I sort of call myself a sclerodermatologist and sometime add a scleroderma pulmonologist because I've had a major interest in pulmonary diseases in, in scleroderma. And my colleagues here, Jim Klinger, who is a professor of medicine in Portland. Portland. Jeez, I'm really screwing Brown, this. Brown. Brown. Providence. Providence, Brown. yes. Oh, dear me. And Dr. Arie Fisher, who is an associate professor at University of Colorado and National Jewish, and Chris Archer-Shika, who is a nurse practitioner at University of Pennsylvania. And what we're going to do today is sort of take each of our sort of expertise and try to share with you uh, what the whole spectrum of connective tissue disease and pulmonary hypertension is. We're going to start out with Dr. Fisher, who's going to just give us the spectrum of connective tissue disease and how it relates to pH. Thank you, Ginny. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Arye Fisher. Pretty much wherever Ginny uh, goes or whatever she's doing, I kind of want to follow in her footsteps. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I, too, am a rheumatologist, and I also have a strong interest in lung disease. And so, um, as I said, wherever Ginny is is sort of where I want to end up going. Um, and it's an honor to share the stage with uh, Jim and Chris as well. So just to get a show of hands here, who is familiar with the term connective tissue disease? So, so pretty, much, pretty much the group. And the other term you will hear sometimes is collagen vascular disease. And if you've heard that as well, everyone's... So we use those interchangeably. It's the way for rheumatologists to confuse the other medical specialties primarily. Our terminology is quite quite confusing because these diseases don't have a lot to do necessarily with collagen or connections and tissue always. Um, they're concepts. So the term connective tissue disease or the term collagen vascular disease, they're used interchangeably and they're meant to describe syndromes that are autoimmune, meaning our immune system is attacking our own bodies, and they are systemic. So these are not focal organ specific, maybe like di diabetes is an example of a organ specific autoimmune disease. The diseases that rheumatologists take care of and the diseases that are associated with PAH are connective tissue disease or collagen vascular disease, which means they are autoimmune disease with systemic manifestations. Thinking about the types of connective tissue disease the list includes systemic sclerosis or systemic scleroderma, systemic lupus, a disease called Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis is often linked into that condition as well, and then we have muscle inflammatory diseases, myositis, poly and dermatomyositis, and then there are other types of connective tissue disease that are either partially presenting, meaning undifferentiated, or perhaps overlapping to some degree between what looks like lupus and systemic sclerosis, and we'll call that mixed connective tissue disease. So connective tissue disease, systemic autoimmune diseases, and why would a rheumatologist be at a PAH and a PHA meeting? Well, because these diseases tend to cause pulmonary hypertension. And in particular, systemic sclerosis or systemic scleroderma uh, has the highest association with PAH within the autoimmune spectrum, within the whole family of connective tissue diseases. So when we talk about a connective tissue disease session, the conversation is often dominated by scleroderma. And the other diseases we'll think about would be lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, because they also have a lot of pulmonary hypertension in them. And then rarely, Sjogren's and rheumatoid and other forms of connective tissue disease will also manifest with pulmonary hypertension. I think I'll stop there and pass on to Jim at this point. 
Um, as Dr. Steen and Dr. Fisher were saying, uh, I'm a pulmonologist, and so maybe not too surprisingly, I also have an interest in, in lung disease. Um, the thing that's uh, <coughs> interesting about um, the connective tissue diseases and the lung doctors is that the disease has the ability, obviously, to attack the lungs as it does the rest of the organs. So I have a tremendous advantage over Dr. Steen and Dr. Fisher. In their role as rheumatologists, they really have to look at how these various connective tissue diseases affect the entire body. And because in the very simplest forms, and I have to be careful here because I'm sitting next to two experts about what causes connective tissue disease, but in the very simple way that I look at this, these are a variety of different autoantibodies that are directed against different types of proteins in our body. And as a result, of course, they can affect any organ in the body. But one of the unique features about the lung is that it's the only organ outside of the heart in which all of the blood has to go through. So we all know where the blood goes, but only a portion of our blood will go to the kidneys, a portion will go to the stomach, a portion will go to the brain. But before it can go anywhere, all of it has to go through the lungs. So it's relatively, I think, straightforward to understand that if there is something in our bloodstream that's causing problems with reaction, anything that's causing that reaction as it circulates through the lungs may have the ability to cause problems with the lungs as well. Now, one of the interesting things about lung disease in scleroderma, or I should say pulmonary hypertension in connective tissue diseases, is that it can be caused really by three different problems. It can be caused by a problem of the blood vessels in the lung. It can be caused by a problem of the tissue itself in the lung, lung tissue disease. And it can actually be caused by the disease affecting the heart and therefore having problems with circulation through the lungs. So what's most interesting about pulmonary hypertension associated with connective tissue diseases is that we contrast it compared to people that have pulmonary hypertension without connective tissue diseases. So I think most people in this audience are aware that the most common type of pulmonary arterial hypertension is this special kind that we call idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And as most of you know, idiopathic is the medical term for doctors don't know what it is, right? And that's literally how we classify it because we don't know why most people with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension get the disease. But what's interesting about them is that when these patients have pulmonary hypertension, the rest of the lungs and the rest of the heart is pretty much unaffected. Whereas patients with scleroderma can have a type of pulmonary hypertension that's very sim similar to idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension or they can have pulmonary hypertension that's associated with pulmonary fibrosis, or they can have pulmonary hypertension that's associated with cardiac dysfunction, a stiffening of the left side of the heart, which results in blood flow backing up into the left lung, or into the, uh, into the lungs. So when we have a patient with connective tissue disease who presents with pulmonary hypertension, we literally have to check three different things that could be affecting the pulmonary hypertension, and of course it's entirely possible for patients to have three out of three or two out of three or just one out of the three things causing pulmonary hypertension. So the connective tissue disease patient with pulmonary hypertension really represents a very special challenge to lung doctors and heart doctors and pulmonologists alike. Okay, I think we'll move on to uh, Chris and have her talk a little bit about how the nursing aspects uh, are affected in patients. So patients with um, the pulmonary hypertension and connective tissue disease have a unique set of additional problems. I'm going to go through a couple of these um, conditions that you um, may have to handle um, and how it does give some challenges in your treatment. So the first is many of you have muscle and joint problems, arthritis, things like myalgias, um, some patients have fibromyalgias, and it makes it a little difficult to look at a six-minute walk test and know if the pulmonary hypertension is getting worse or you're having more struggles with your muscle and um, joints. And treatments would include things like aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, sometimes physical therapy, use of assistive devices. So those are how we manage that. Gastrointestinal problems is a huge category. Many of these patients have heartburn, reflux, swallowing problems, problems with esophageal motility, 
problems with irritable bowel, either diarrhea or constipation. Some patients have overgrowth of bacteria in their GI tract. Um, and so these cause symptoms such as problems eating, um, weight loss, problems with nutrition, feeling bloated, um, feeling full, not able to even eat a full meal, problems absorbing nutrition and nutrients. Um, and these can be treated with medications, with um, attention to how you sit down and eat a meal, that you eat it slowly, chew your food very well, um, not rush. Um, reflex is managed with avoiding foods that may trigger, um, greasy foods, foods that are very spicy, eating late at night and then laying down and going to sleep, raising sometimes the head of the bed, um, sometimes small frequent meals, um, kind of grazing through the course of a day is helpful. And then we also have medications that can help, antacids, um, proton pump inhibitors to reduce um, acid in the stomach, and management of diarrhea and constipation, and sometimes antibiotics to um, manage the bacteria overgrowth in the bowel. <clears throat> Raynaud's is another big um, challenge for patients with connective tissue disease. Um, the fingertips have um, blood vessels that constrict. It's sometimes in response to the environment, a room like this where it's so cold. Um, emotional stress. Um, sometimes fi uh, fingers can turn white and blanch, or so then they may turn a little blue or dusky from lack of oxygen and then kind of reddish as the circulation returns. Um, the, the hands can be very painful and affect your finger dexterity. Um, patients can develop little ulcerations on their fingers um, with the loss of circulation. Some people lose a lot of circulation in their fingers and maybe lose a fingertip from that. Um, and we as nurses are concerned about that because it makes it difficult to manage some of the medications. Um, especially things like the inhaled medications and the IV medications. So we try to use um, some other devices to help. Like I know when I've had to teach patients with IV administration, um, the little, um, instead of using a little coin on the pump, we use like a little screwdriver because it's a little easier for them to manage. Um, We've also used um, family members to help, so it's not uncommon that we've taught everybody in the family how to help mix IV medication to be a backup support for these patients. So it, it takes a little more time, but we're able to accomplish getting um, patients on therapies that do require some dexterity. Interstitial lung disease um, or pulmonary fibrosis, um, which causes increased shortness of breath, um, hypoxemia, decreased stamina. Um, we manage this by helping patients with oxygen. We try to help them with the equipment to pick a portable um, system that's lightweight. Sometimes we um, employ a conserving device to kind of make your tank last a little bit longer. Um, and sometimes then we also have to employ medications to kind of turn down the immune system so that the lung disease does not um, get worse. And the last one I thought about was fatigue. And there's multiple causes for fatigue. Um, there's chronic anemia, there's poor nutrition, there's problems with the GI tract. So we teach patients and to kind of conserve their energy, take some naps, rest, don't be afraid to ask others for help, to kind of conserve their energy, control stress. And those are just a couple of uh, uh, little things that we employ to kind of help deal with these issues. Okay. Well, I think you can see this is a, a really challenging area and, and how absolutely important it is for all of a few patients with connective tissue disease and pulmonary hypertension to, to interact with all kinds of people, with our, your pulmonologist, with your rheumatologist, as well as with your uh, nurse and uh, allied health professionals. We were talking about exercise a little bit in the previous session. So I think now uh, we'll open this up to questions. I'm sure you all have questions that you ha want to have us uh, discuss. We're going to try to do it as general as we can, and uh, um, hopefully we'll answer them. 
Okay, okay uh, two-parter. Is crest hereditary? Is secondary pH caused by crest hereditary? And if the answer is no, how do you know this? Okay, well, that, that's a fairly easy one because um, crest is a syndrome which is part of systemic sclerosis, scleroderma, and is not really a hereditary disease. Um, the genetics of scleroderma are such that there are risk factors in the genes, but it's not like heritable type of pulmonary hypertension. So family members are at increased risk for any of the connective tissue disease, but it's not a direct hereditary type of thing. And in, within pulmonary hypertension in connective tissue disease, it, it's associated with different autoantibodies. So in that way, it might be sort of heritage, but not specifically. One of the uh, very interesting things about the pulmonary hypertension that we see in connective tissue disease is that it rarely carries any of the genetic mutations that we see in people who have pulmonary hypertension without connective tissue disease. So if you have a person who has pulmonary hypertension and does not have connective tissue disease, there is a not insignificant chance that they may carry a gene that could increase the risk of the rest of their family members of having pulmonary hypertension. But if you have connective tissue disease and pulmonary hypertension associated with that, there's a very little risk that there's actually a gene in there that you could pass on to your family. So I just wanted to add, just uh, Ginny, to clarify one thing about this term crest, um, which a lot of people hear. It, it has to do with some of the skin and vascular manifestations, so C for calcinosis, calcium deposits, R for Raynaud's phenomenon, like we heard about from Chris, and then esophageal for E, esophageal involvement, S, sclerodactyly, thickening of the skin of the hands, and T, telangiectasia, which are those capillaries that'll come to the surface of the skin. Really, crest is a term that sometimes people have this false sense of maybe security that it's really not systemic sclerosis. It's really not the full-blown version, so to speak. It's not maybe as concerning or difficult or challenging as systemic sclerosis. But in fact, when, when, when thinking about the lung manifestations, which really do drive so much in terms of morbidity and unfortunately mortality, we want to highlight that crest is systemic sclerosis. These patients may, in fact, be the highest risk for the development of PAH, particularly because they're so often centromere antibody positive, and that protein seems to convey a higher risk for PAH. So I've seen a handful or more over the last number of years of individuals who were told, you just have crest, it's not really systemic sclerosis, and maybe haven't been as vigilant with respect to lung-oriented screening. I think you may have just answered my question. I'm fairly new to pH, and uh, I had all known that I had crest, but I never really followed up or, or did anything. Um, now I'm starting to get the pH under control. Is it important to uh, have a scleroderma specialist or to be seen at a scleroderma center? We, I don't really have anyone locally that, that I see for that. So, um, I mean, again, Ginny has sort of led, that, led the charge in this regard. Um, certainly, um, we would always recommend that you're under the care of somebody who sees a lot of scleroderma and is comfortable with that illness uh, and manages those patients on a regular basis. Considering it's a rare entity, very often patients find themselves going to scleroderma centers for that reason. Uh, like at Georgetown, at the University of Colorado, and other institutions that are represented at the table. Um, the important point, and maybe you know, the, the segue from my initial comments, yes, crest is systemic sclerosis, and so it's unfortunately not surprising to see pulmonary complications in that regard. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything to add. We are trying very hard to educate our rheumatology colleagues because that's, that's where the diagnosis has to be made. And you all that already have pulmonary hypertension, and you, some people don't even know they have scleroderma. And so we see patients that have had scleroderma for 20 years, as far as we are concerned, but they just are diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. So our goal, a lot of our goal as rheumatologists is, is really to, to get the word out to general rheumatologists. But as far as, as far as 
having the diagnosis of both diseases, I think that the important thing is you work together with your doctors because the pulmonologist isn't particularly super comfortable with all the other systemic manifications. The rheumatologist certainly isn't comfortable with all the, the medications that, certainly the, the, the severe types of medications. So it, it does have to be teamwork that works. As far as scleroderma centers, it, it's nice to at least have been seen by someone at a scleroderma center, but that's obviously not always possible. And, and you, you know, you just know that we're around if, if problems exist. Uh, yes, I, I have uh, scleroderma as primary and uh, pH as secondary. And in the last year, <clears throat> my vision has uh, deteriorated. I've just been declared legally blind. Uh, so far, luckily, I haven't run over anybody with my scooter as yet, but <clears throat> but uh, the doctor, uh, ophthalmologist, uh, uh, glaucoma specialist is saying that if you have full-blown scleroderma with, with Raynaud's and Sjogren's, that your eyes could be affected, and, uh, and, it, and I have what they're calling low-pressure glaucoma, <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, the left eye is already gone, and the right eye is uh, is uh, fading. So uh, I understand now that there is a complication with scleroderma, Raynaud's, Sjogren's, and vision. Uh, is that correct, or um, certainly not very common? There's there have been some case reports, but generally glaucoma and and eye involvement is other than dryness of the eyes is not, uh, the, the dry eyes is a very common thing, but glaucoma and, you know, some other things really are, are very uncommon, and I, I wouldn't specifically put it in the category of a scleroderma-related complication. Hi, I'm Gail Bucci. I'm a um, physician's assistant in southwest Florida, and I'm fortunate enough to have had, be an 18-year survivor, so those of you that are new to this, don't worry about it, it's a piece of cake. Um, I did want to make a couple of suggestions, if you don't mind me kind of intruding in your panel here. Any public sweet bay, grocery store, Walmart, or whatever, they have a little package, and there's three little paring knives in there. It's 99 cents. And those little paring knives can open blister packs for your pills, or like you were talking about, any type of medication you have to get into. That's a real good thing to suggest to your patients. Everybody can afford 99 cents, and if they can't call me, I'll buy you one. <laughs> and um, I just want you to know, you know, little by little, things may gradually come up on you, and you'll be like, what the heck is this? Why are my hands all purple? Do not be afraid to ask your doctor, and that, that doctor doesn't answer your question satisfactorily. You contact another doctor, and you can always call the Pulmonary Hypertension Association's helpline, and they will get you in touch with a doctor who knows what they're talking about and get you help. Thank you, Gail. That was nice. Yes, thank you. My name is Jan. Uh, my husband passed away uh, four years ago at 53. Everything you listed was Crest-related. Uh, Raynaud's, he had for years and years, the ulcerations, uh, scleroderma in, in, in uh, the organs affecting the lungs, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and it did turn into pH. And um, he, the only other thing he did have was apnea, sleep apnea. So I was wondering if there's any relation, correlation between uh, having the whole basket. In fact, that's how I found out he had Crest. I just researched and uh, just wonder if there's any correlation with the sleep apnea, too. Thank you. Yeah, we're just kind of looking at it ourselves here. I'm not aware of any association with any of the connective tissue diseases and sleep apnea. Now, certainly there is a relationship between sleep apnea and pulmonary hypertension, um, and that gets to be somewhat complicated as well. But in, in short, you need oxygen to dilate the blood vessels in your lungs, so anything that decreases that oxygen, such as holding your breath while you're sleeping will, will make your pressures go up. But it's probably a, a different problem uh, other than the, the connective tissue disease. Um, most people should know sleep apnea is very common in the general population. Up to 10% or more of people have sleep apnea. So obviously a large chunk of people with connective tissue disease are also going to have sleep apnea, um, not related to the connective tissue disease. 
the only other thing to add um, within the setting of pulmonary fibrosis, a lot of these patients are given steroids, corticosteroids, which then do uh, impact in terms of bo body size, body habitus, neck, and sometimes obesity, and that may be a risk factor. Yes, I have eight autoimmune diseases. Um, the most frustrating, Addison's disease, because I can't get my cortisol in the normal range. Do you have any comments about having more than one autoimmune disease and how it all relates to everything else? It, it's actually very common to have multiple autoimmune disease. There are probably, probably most people have more than, quote, one autoimmune disease, and there, there are a lot of interrelationships. Addison's probably the outside one that we don't usually see, but certainly autoimmune thyroid disease and Sjogren's and scleroderma, all of these thing, types of things fit in very commonly together. And sometimes they just, when you have a problem it's, it's, and you have an autoimmune disease, it's sort of just assumed that that other problem is also autoimmune, but we, we can't say for sure, but it's very common to have multiple ones. I have uh, scleroderma as well as pH. Uh, I have a uh, pH doctor as well as a rheumatologist, but the rheumatologist has basically told me that she's not prescribing any medication for the scleroderma because most of the pH meds can help slow the scleroderma down, but I'm seeing more and more manifestations of the scleroderma. Is there anything I can suggest to my rheumatologist. Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll bounce this one back and forth a little bit. I, I, I would really, uh, again, highlight this concept that there's got to be a little bit of a teamwork, you know, approach here. So, you know, I don't know if your doctors are, you know, texting each other or you know, email friends or see each other in cafeterias or conferences, but you know, one of the things that I think really works well is when your doctors work well together. Um, so it sounds like in your case there's a disconnect, and that is something that needs to be fixed. Um, and truth is, sometimes there may not be the best options for treating the scleroderma, but certainly it sounds like you're getting mixed messages and or you're having problems that might be better addressed if your docs were working a little bit more closely together. Remember, we don't have any treatments to, quote, cure scleroderma, or, quote, treat scleroderma. All of our treatments at this point are directed to, towards the different manifestations, and we have lots of them, just like we have lots of medicines for pulmonary hypertension, lots for Raynaud's, lots for GI, a lot of different symptom management, but no, no major um, medication at this point. We're working very hard. We've got lots of clinical trials that are going on, but we don't have a drug that says this is going to make the scleroderma stop. Maybe I'll, I'll throw this back to Jenny for a second. I mean, part of the, part of the reality, I think, and let me know what you think, the, the rarity of scleroderma from the standpoint of a traditional community practice, I think, does lend to some, whether it's... Um, discomfort or, or not really knowing, being a little bit uncertain about how to best approach the patient. And I don't know if that's what you've seen also. No, it's, cer it's certainly very true, again, because, because scleroderma has such a wide set of manifestations. If the general rheumatologist sees 10 patients in a year, each one is going to be completely different. And so that's one of the reasons why the scleroderma centers have been helpful, to try to be helpful to uh, teach the, uh, both the patients and the, and the doctors on how to better manage the, the aspects of it. And we have the Scleroderma Foundation representatives here today, and that, that's also another very good source of, of information so that you can be proactive about your specific problems if your rheumatologist isn't addressing them. I really just had a comment, not a question, and it really applies to the two ladies in the back with their situations with their rheumatologists. And I just wanted to tell them that if they're finding their rheumatologists aren't responsive to them, if they go to a scleroderma support group, they can query the group about what doctors they have found in the area, especially if there's not a scleroderma center. And usually the support group is one of the best places to find who is helping people in the city. Very, very good idea. 
Okay, I have a question about um, going the next step. The next step being transplants and LAS. I've seen a little bit of attention on the PAHA website about LAS and how it's calculated and how it may or may not disadvantage some people over others, and scleroderma is mentioned. Do you have any insight on the LAS score and how it may or may not disadvantage a scleroderma patient? <laughs> Look at the <laughs> So yes and no. Um, I'm not aware of anything in the LAS score that will get you to the top of the transplant list, list sooner by having scleroderma-associated pulmonary hypertension. There are a variety of complications that interfere with lung transplant uh, in the scleroderma patient, which usually means that they require more time to evaluate. And I think probably the biggest one is this problem with uh, gastrointestinal reflux. So if that's not properly controlled, many centers get hesitant about transplanting a new lung into that situation because you can aspirate and and destroy the lung graft. Um, However, that being said, there are transplant centers that do transplant patients with scleroderma lung disease, both pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and so uh, if for any reason you're in a, the middle of a transplant evaluation and, there's, and you're getting information that something can't be done because of the scleroderma, it's a good idea to check in with some other, uh, some of the larger transplant centers that, that have that done. Usually the, the driving forces with uh, LAS scores are the age of the patient and the severity of the pulmonary hypertension. So the younger you are and the worse your pulmonary hypertension is, the, the higher you get to the score. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that those scores are changeable and they do change regularly. So if you've got a score that doesn't put you in a good position for a lung transplant, um, as time goes by, those scores should be reevaluated. And of course, as you get sicker, you should be moving up the list. So don't hesitate to call your doctor back and say, you know, uh, something new has happened. It's, it's harder for me to do this, that, or the other thing. It usually requires additional diagnostic testing, but, but sometimes that can make a difference. My question is about fibrosis. I was wondering how common is it with scleroderma, and um, what are the symptoms, like how would I know if I have it, and what causes it? So uh, a number of us can answer this question, Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, So first of all, lung fibrosis um, is very common in scleroderma. Uh, It is seen in the majority of patients who have scleroderma. If we were to get a high resolution, really very fine cut uh, images uh, on CAT scan, we would see it in, you know, maybe three quarters of the scleroderma population. That being said, it is not clinically relevant In in other words, it does not necessarily cause trouble. It does not necessarily um, lead to progression in that many patients. That would only be maybe in 20 to 30 percent, roughly. Um, Symptoms are are not that different from pH in that it's breathlessness, it's fatigue. Cough is pretty common in scleroderma for reasons related to fibrosis, but more commonly because of esophageal reflux disease. So fibrosis is very common. It's a completely different entity than pulmonary hypertension with completely different treatments. Um, the question is, is it really doing anything? Because it's, a, it's often an incidental finding, but needs careful surveillance to make sure it doesn't progress. So we depend a lot on pulmonary function tests because we can't tell anything, and you really can't, as well as these high-resolution CT scan. And we've... Um, and investing in a lot of research as far as trying to stop the fibrotic process. That's one of the areas that's sort of easier to measure than some of the skin things, so that there have been a lot of studies with medications to try to stop the fibrotic process in the lungs. But it's, it's so variable in scleroderma because there are many patients that have very aggressive disease that then just stops and then it stays stable for many, 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 many years, and it doesn't progress. And so then we get into this confusion and, and situation where we have a patient with scleroderma that has pulmonary fibrosis and then develops pulmonary hypertension. And then the question is, is this related to the pulmonary fibrosis? Is it idiopathic, quote, or you know, just on its own? Or is it a pulmonary vasculopathy related to the scleroderma, but 
just having incidental uh, fibrosis. And at this point, all the drugs that have been tested for pulmonary hypertension have really excluded patients with any significant pulmonary fibrosis. So we don't know what that kind of pulmonary hypertension, how that responds to drugs, and that's a, certainly an area of unmet need that we're, we're working on and trying to, to learn more about. Um, but it's, it's mostly through testing um, that we can tell the extent of it and the, and the course of it, which is, is the most important thing. The, uh, the question that you asked about how do I know when I have it is, I think, very important because the, the driving symptom is almost always shortness of breath. And there are, there are three, in general, types of shortness of breath. In order to breathe properly, you have to be able to get air into your lungs. That's really the breathing, like the, the bellows, the mechanical part, the air going in and out. And then you have to be able to get the oxygen in the air to diffuse into the blood vessels that are going through the lungs. And that's the pulmonary hypertension part. And then you have to take that oxygenated blood and pump it around the body, and that's what the heart is for. And unfortunately, patients with connective tissue disease can have abnormalities of all three of those things. So if there's too much fibrosis, you can have difficulty getting the, the air in. If the blood vessels are too narrowed, you can have difficulty getting the, the air to absorb the oxygen into the bloodstream. And if the heart is affected by the connective tissue disease, then you can have difficulty pumping that blood forward in order to, to oxygenate the body. So it, it takes uh, a physician who's looking at all three systems, air in, gas exchange across, and then cardiac going forward. And people who deal with pulmonary hypertension are used to looking at all the different different tests that we use to evaluate those three systems. Sometimes, unfortunately, if you just go to a heart doctor, you just get a heart evaluation. If you just go to a lung doctor, you just get a lung evaluation. If you just go to a, um, uh, a gas exchange doctor, I don't think there is a gas exchange doctor. <laughs> uh, so it's important that, that, that um, all three components be evaluated, and unfortunately, that usually requires a, a lot of different tests. Um, could you please touch on some of the less commonly occurring uh, connective tissue diseases with PAH, such as rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren syndrome? Um, they're much less well studied because they're much less common, and so it's a little bit hard to know what the natural history is. Um, rheumatoid arthritis more commonly has interstitial lung disease, and then theoretically it may be secondary to the interstitial, but um, the natural history of the other types of connective tissue disease, pulmonary hypertension, is much less well understood. Our, Dr. Fisher has had a special interest in these, so... I yeah, I think, um, you know, well stated. Uh, what we know is that they occur, pulmonary hypertension occurs far less commonly in those others relative to how commonly it occurs in scleroderma. So as an example, uh, rheumatologists, their practices are filled with rheumatoid arthritis patients. Rheumatoid arthritis affects about 1% of the adult population worldwide. And yet the, the cause, the incidence of pulmonary hypertension in rheumatoid arthritis is so low relative to scleroderma. So as Ginny is saying, we just don't know what the natural history of what a rheumatoid PAH patient looks like because they're just so infrequently encountered. Um, most of us in rheumatology, when we see rheumatoid arthritis and we see PAH, we kind of question whether they're really linked, whether or not this is idiopathic PAH and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and sometimes what's called Sjogren's by a pulmonologist or other physicians may actually be what we would call scleroderma. And so the terminology and registries and the way patients are characterized and categorized in registries may not really reflect always reality. Uh, we're so biased towards the scleroderma spectrum with PAH that when we see the Sjogren's show up in there or some of these lupus patients, we probably think that they have scleroderma. So then would you suggest that somebody who has uh, one or both of those be uh, evaluated as, as a scleroderma center? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... I think being under the care of you know, physicians, uh, providers who are comfortable with pulmonary hypertension and providers who are comfortable with rheumatology, be that at a center or not, I think, all, I think just being in competent hands would be the recommendation. There are a lot of autoantibodies that are associated with connective tissue diseases, and sometimes um, you know, if you have some of these antibodies, even if you don't have the full-blown 
manifestations, the doctor sort of hones in on that blood test and said, oh, you have this blood test, you have that disease, and it really doesn't necessarily fit. So it's, it's sometimes a, a, a challenging uh, diagnosis to make. With scleroderma and uh, PAH uh, and maybe Sjogren's, uh, what is the muscle uh, context? In other words, why do you ache all over? <laughs> Why do you what? Ache. Why, why do you patients? Oh. <laughs> so, Chris addressed this a little bit um, earlier. Um, it, first of all, you know, pain is an unfortunately very common uh, symptom encountered in rheumatology clinics, encountered in general medicine clinics, really just encountered, period. So, we do see a lot of pain uh, as part of rheumatologic patient care. Um, sometimes it's difficult to discern the cause of the pain, whether it's uh, fibromyalgia, really pain of unexplained uh, cause. We just don't understand why the patient hurts with all the normal testing or whatnot. Uh, some patients have true, let's say, overlap features of rheumatoid arthritis, and that's a cause of pain, or osteoarthritis. So pain is something that we see. We see muscle inflammation and muscle-oriented pain quite commonly. I don't know that I have good answers as to why. We just see a lot of it. Well, the oxygen, not having, not having uh, adequate oxygen because of having lung disease and decreased blood supply to, to muscles, deconditioning. Um, there, there are just many different reasons, but it's probably going to be difficult to, to focus on you know, any, one, uh, any one thing. Um, this is a follow-up to uh, the fibrosis uh, comments. Um, I read uh, the other day that there was a discovery at the University of Pittsburgh, I believe, of something they called E4 that uh, actually they found to reverse fibrosis in mice and stuff. And I'm wondering if that is real, uh, what's the future of it, or what do you know about it? Well, it's a very exciting finding, and it's certainly by a very rep reputable investigator. And it's just going to, like so many basic science uh, evaluations, we're just going to have to wait and see how it, how it pans out into taking it out of the basic science uh, arena. Um, how, how big of a, I mean, is this really significant, or is it just another research thing? Uh, well, there are lots of things in research that prevent and reverse fibrosis. And the que again, the question is, is this going to be a unique thing that really is going to make the difference as far as scleroderma fibrosis, that, which it seems to be unique to scleroderma yeah. lung fibrosis? We, I think it's just going to be time to tell. Um, I, I, I just can't, you know, we just don't know yet. I think it's very difficult for, for patients that have the disease to follow the reports in the newspaper because, you know, the, the truth of the matter is most of the scientific breakthroughs start this way. So there's a discovery that's made in a lab, usually in an animal mo a model, usually a very small animal like a mouse or a rat, and then it goes to the next level and it's successful there. And by the time it gets all the way up and it's in clinical trials, that's where you can trace its origins to. However, the majority, unfortunately, of the discoveries that are successful in animals actually turn out not being successful in, in humans. And so you, you can't in any way jump to the fact that if it you know, worked in a mouse, it's going to work in a human, and you really can't do anything faster other than wait for it to go to the, to the next level to see if it's tested. So hopefully it will be a really important discovery, but I don't think there's anybody, including the lab, that discovered it that knows whether or not it's going to be relevant to, to patients one day. I was diagnosed three months ago with um, pulmonary hypertension group 2. Um, a number of years ago, um, I was tested, and my ANA was high, and they said, okay, you, you know, you have rheumatoid arthritis. I was treated for, for a year and a half and didn't do any good, so I took myself off to a rheumatologist that treated fibromyalgia and was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Now, we come to this time period, and um, about a year and a half ago, the RA came with a vengeance, really, really bad. And um, rheumatologists put me on Plaquenil and prednisone. Then recently, I was diagnosed with uh, the pH. 
And uh, my rheumatologist, I guess, is is somewhat uh, conservative, and he's reluctant to put me on any other medication for the the RA because he says so many of them have cardiac implications, and he's afraid of interfering with the what's going on with the pH. Do you have anything to say about about that? I mean, he's not even won't even consider methotrexate. He's extremely conservative. <laughs> it certainly is true that some of the medications with RA interfere with heart function, but um, you got to do the balancing act. And if you can't function because the arthritis is so bad that you can't exercise, and it, you know, you really have to make the the you know. Balanced. I find the rheumatologist is what you're saying. I, I, <laughs> uh, the, there is, I mean, there is a class of drugs that you probably have seen commercials or whatnot about in magazines. This whole anti-TNF class, Remicade and Umera and Enbrel and a couple others now that appear to be a problematic in in some patients with congestive heart failure. And so, if there's heart failure as the cause, if it's a group two pulmonary hypertension where there's a concern for cardiac disease, I could understand why. Why maybe those may not be ideal, but as Dr. Steen is saying, there are a number of other options, and it is a balancing act. So I, yeah, I guess I need to push him or find somebody else. Huh? And, and your story of it sounded like there were a couple different diagnoses and labels oh. attached it is not that uncommon. We hear from lots of individuals that they had positive blood tests that were confusing and different scenarios evolve over time and of course everybody's different and those yeah. scenarios are challenging. Well about six months in there in the middle of all that I, I had Sjogren's but then all of a sudden I didn't have it. <laughs> Again these these are uh, diseases that although we have criteria we have blood tests it still is a Syndrome. It's still a group of manifestations. And just like making a diagnosis of lupus, we don't make the diagnosis of lupus unless you have both blood tests and clinical symptoms that are characteristic. But not all rheumatologists take that. You, just, you get a positive blood test for lupus, somebody's going to give you the diagnosis of lupus. And it really depends on the approach by the rheumatologist uh, and, the, and the physician that you're seeing. So I think that the, the diagnosis of connective tissue disease is a challenge, and, and it does change depending on, on what physician you're seeing if, and how careful they are in making the diagnosis. Yes, will you address the patient that doesn't test positive on an ANA test? Um, yeah, that's that, that's that certainly happens. Um, there are the again the diagnosis is not made just by blood tests and and depending on the laboratory, depending on the patient. Um, I just recently did a study with one of the new methods of doing ANAs, and 40% of my scleroderma patients that clearly had scleroderma had a negative ANA on that method. So the commercial laboratories are doing ANAs that aren't picking up all of the uh, scleroderma antibodies these days, and so it's, it's making it even harder for the rheumatologists if they don't realize that this is the ANA method that their commercial lab is using. So it, it's unfortunately being challenging to, to use these antibodies, but they're very, very helpful. The antibodies are, are extremely helpful in sort of focusing on what the what some of the complications that um, the patient may have. Like Dr. Fisher was saying, the anti-centromere antibody, which is the classic antibody for Crest syndrome or limited scleroderma, that patient population is at a much higher risk for getting pulmonary vascular, pulmonary arterial hypertension than somebody with one of the other autoantibodies. So again, in the rheumatology community, that's what we're trying to, uh, to help teach. Um, my question. I, have, uh, I had a very, very severe case of polymyositis where I was hospitalized for over a year. Uh, about five months into the diagnosis, I went into respiratory failure. Um, and then after that was 
on oxygen and everything. But I didn't get the pH uh, diagnosis until after I went home. And the pH diagnosis came almost immediately um, through the emergency room, really. My question is, um, do you think that there is an association of the muscle? Uh, because my diaphragm muscle, all of this was affected by the myositis. And, um, and my heart, which is a muscle, um, I'm wondering is, you know, because earlier you said that you didn't know a lot about the connective tissue and um, the other ones like myositis and its association to the pH. But I'm, I'm, after listening to you, I'm wondering if there really is association with that muscle. I, I think that's probably where many of the myositis patients are diagnosed with pH, either through the heart muscle with heart involvement in group two or because they have severe interstitial lung disease, which is a major part of polymyositis or of, of yeah. some of the myositis. So that the myositis family of diseases are more likely to have these other two kinds rather than the primary pulmonary vascular or pulmonary arterial disease. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. The, mus the muscle and the lung uh, can then lead to the pulmonary hypertension. Okay. I know. Oh, I don't know, Jim. One. I mean, I think this goes back, Jim, to your initial points about the the, yeah. the connective tissue disease patient and how challenging they are. Yeah, I, I would. I think it might be time to, to to emphasize. We we talk about pulmonary hypertension like it's one disease, and of course, pulmonary hypertension means that the blood pressure in the lungs is elevated. Any type of lung disease that you have will cause some increase of pressures in the lungs. And of course, the more severe the disease, usually the higher the pressure. So anytime I hear about a patient who's been in the hospital for a year or been on a ventilator because they can't breathe, that tells me there's something wrong with the whole heart-lung system. And so it's relatively common to find pulmonary hypertension there. Then there's this type of disease that we call pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the greatest feature of that particular disease is despite the fact that the lung tissue is healthy, the heart is healthy, you can get air in and out of the lungs, the pressure is still high. And in that situation, it's usually markedly high. And that's the one we get most concerned about because that's usually the severest form of pulmonary hypertension, and that's the one that usually causes the heart to fail and where we get into problems with. So pulmonary hypertension can be a relatively, I don't want to say benign, but less worrisome problem if it occurs as the result of the underlying lung disease. And it can be a much more severe problem if it occurs without there being a good explanation for it. And one of the things we get concerned about with scleroderma is teasing that out. That is to say, if you have this group two pulmonary hypertension that's due to the fact that the scleroderma has affected your heart, the heart disease is what you're most concerned about, and the pulmonary hypertension really becomes a secondary issue. If you have pulmonary hypertension with scleroderma that's mostly resulted to the fibrosis you've developed, the lung fibrosis, we call that group three, then again, your primary problem is scleroderma-induced lung fibrosis, and the pulmonary hypertension is kind of a secondary issue. But if you don't have much pulmonary fibrosis, and you don't have much heart disease from your scleroderma, and now you have pulmonary hypertension, now we get concerned because in that situation, you've got this group one pulmonary hypertension, and now the pulmonary hypertension is your biggest problem associated with your scleroderm. So it does take a little while to, to fish out which problem's the, the, the most important. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my husband has scleroderma and pH, and our daughter has uh, ankylosing spondylitis with the markings for scleroderma. He was the carrier for the ankylosing splendylitis. What are her possibilities of coming down with either scleroderma or pH? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the ankylosing spondylitis is a lot easier because it is a, a, a tends to be an inherited disease, and so uh, it's less common in women, um, but it, it certainly is uh, a, a real entity. Again, the scleroderma um, is not something that's specifically 
inherited it. The connective tissue diseases run in families because they have certain similar genes, but it's not a direct uh, inherited uh, process. When I'm asked about this by other patients, you know, it's not the kind of thing where we ask people to bring their kids in for testing or bring in their siblings for testing. It's just not done that way. So, again, highlighting that these are not truly, you know, genetically, you know, um, Inherited, we don't see, um, we do see some signal, but it's a very, very weak signal. So it's the kind of thing where we really ask the individual to see their doctor for problems that may arise, just like anybody else would. Yeah, I just have a question for Christine. If uh, you can comment upon uh, maintaining your weight, I have real trouble uh, eating. I'm a very slow eater. So what kind of supplements can you suggest? There's different supplements out on the market. Um, there's like Boost and Ensure. Um, sometimes you could do like a Carnation instant breakfast, make a little smoothie, like drink half of it, put the other half in the refrigerator, freezer. Um, but the important things are to eat small meals, kind of to graze through the day. Um, take your time eating. Don't lay down, obviously, afterwards because of potential for reflux. And really monitor your weight. Um, perhaps consider talking with your doctor about multivitamin, things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Hi there. Uh, do you recommend somebody who's been diagnosed with scleroderma to be screened for pH periodically with a, with an echo? Absolutely. I mean, this is an area that, as Dr. Steen mentioned, in terms of educating the rheumatology community, educating primary care providers. So this is a major, major uh, really educational gap that we have. And so the, the real efforts are being put forward now with whether it's pharmaceutical support, whether it's other avenues for education. We do have PAH-specific therapies, and they really have changed the natural history of survival in this group of patients. And so fundamental, this is not ancillary, fundamental to the care of a scleroderma patient. Uh, is annual, if not more than annual, assessments uh, for PAH. And those assessments could include echocardiography. That's typically the cornerstone. Pulmonary function testing, watching what patients' parameters are doing over time. Uh, it's just, you can't, we can't emphasize that enough. Talking to our patients about how short of breath they are or aren't, but sometimes that's not reliable because of sedentary realities, musculoskeletal impairments. So when we introduce ourselves to our scleroderma patients in particular, but to others as well, whether it's some of our lupus patients and mixed connective tissue disease patients, but the introductory comments and sort of that first meeting is setting an agenda of lifelong screening, certainly on an annual basis, sometimes more frequently. and. It often involves teamwork between the pulmonologist, cardiologist to integrate data that are derived from those screening tests to make sure that they're being interpreted appropriately and acted on appropriately. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I would be the poster girl for what you're talking about. I, through my scleroderma group, I was introduced to the pH specialist in my city, and I started going to him once a year with the understanding if I noticed any change that I would call him more often. And at my yearly checkup, he said, is anything different? This is after I'd had my echocardiogram and my PFTs. And, and I said to him, well, I've noticed when I push my trash can about a block because I live on a, piece, a large piece of property up to the corner, I'm a little out of breath if it's heavy. And his eyebrow kind of went up and he said, we're going to do a right heart cath. I was diagnosed within five days and he said I had about the lowest pH score he could, he could rate and put me on medication, and I have been stable on Bravadio for three years so far. So you need to get tested as often as you can. That's you. absolutely what we all believe in, and I think that's a, a good uh, way to uh, end this session. And thank you very much for all of you attending. Thank you.